Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final stakeholder meeting for the Kansas Low Distortion Projection Coordinate System Project. Uh, I'm Mike Dillner with uh, Professional Engineering Consultants. Uh, I've uh, been with PEC a little over a year now, and uh, before that, I was with KDOT for, as many of you I'm sure know, for right around 15 years, uh, and was involved in this project on during my time with KDOT as well. Um, with me here, I guess in the back of the room maybe, uh, right here, Mr. David Lee. He's head of surveys over at the Topeka office for professional engineering consultants. He, uh, he's been surveying for about 26 years and licensed since 2001. Been surveying for PECs for seven, so. Um, next to me, well, he was next to me. He just moved over to the back, but you see Mr. Mark Siegelquist. He is the... Uh, KDOT project manager for the for the low distortion projection project, and uh, he is the CAD administrator here at KDOT. Has been for quite some time, and has been with KDOT for over 33 years. Um, and last but not least is Mr. Michael Dennis over here to my left. Uh, Michael is the president and owner of Geodetic Analysis LLC. Uh, he is a registered land surveyor and professional engineer in Arizona. He also works for NGS as a geodesist and is, on top of all of that, pursuing a PhD in geomatics at uh, engineering at Oregon State University. So that's some of the primary players involved with, with the KDOT LDP project. Um, I was going to go over a little bit of the project history. Uh, this all kind of started as a parallel effort to the the KDOT 3D modeling initiative. Uh, when we initially went to uh, Oklahoma for a 3D, 3D modeling meeting down there, we had heard of Iowa's coordinate system that's the same thing, a low distortion projection coordinate system. The first we had heard of it. And uh, when we kind of brought it back, we were looking for a project that where the 3D modeling initiative is kind of a big barge moving you know, forward or very slowly, we needed something that we could kind of break off and uh, tackle at the time. And uh, this, this low distortion projection project was it, uh, something that we could pursue federal funding for, and, uh, and it should work pretty well. So uh, that started, that workshop that we went to was in March of 2015. The official project start was uh, what, November of 2016. And we had our initial stakeholder meeting where we brought all of our stakeholders in in January 2017. And of course, our final stakeholder meeting today. I did want to note another point about today is that we've got the main presentation of the coordinate system to you or for you guys uh, from 10 to noon. But there's also a work session this afternoon for any of you guys that are interested. I know a lot of the KDOT surveyors will be attending that as well, but that's from 1, 1 to 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And it'll be right here in the same room, unless we decide to take a field trip. So, um, and then the project will be wrapped up at the end of September. So, and by then, a lot of the additional deliverables uh, will be available. So we're talking microstation files, uh, or microstation coordinate definitions, AutoCAD coordinate definitions. Uh, I think Kyle was one safe FME, but there'll be a myriad of them. Right now, there's the Esri, <laughs> Uh, PRJ definitions are hosted on the site, and Michael will get into some of that, uh, where you can find some of this information when he when he does his presentation. Um, just an overview of the Kansas Regional Coordinate System. It's a system of 20 low distortion projection zones that uh, cover the entire state uh, within a, a very tight tolerance of, of distortion. And Michael will cover a lot of this later, so I don't want to get too in-depth right now, but some of the, uh, the stakeholders we had mentioned getting involved, uh, we've had the input and the pleasure of working with uh, the American Council of Engineering Companies, Kansas Association of Mappers, uh, Kansas Data Access and Support Center, who's actually hosting the website, uh, Kansas Society of Land Surveyors, uh, the National Geodetic Survey, and the Kansas Geological Survey. Uh, we've had quite a few KDOT staff from a myriad of different sections. I know the district surveyors are involved and uh, GIS guys, and it's just a pretty good swath. Um, 
But with that, that's that's all I had as far as introductions go. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Michael Dennis. Well, thanks everyone for coming to this presentation. It looks like a pretty good turnout. Is this mainly uh, KDOT people in the room? We have others from outside of KDOT too. You don't have to raise your hands. I know everybody's shy. That's how these things are. Later on, you'll get more lively, I hope, about it, more um, less restrained. So Mike already introduced me. He's Mike, I'm Michael, that's how we'll keep it straight in here. And I'm gonna talk about this new thing, the Kansas Regional Coordinate System. Now we had an initial stakeholder meeting in the middle of January, if I remember right, and some of you may have seen that one as well. And so I was told that I need to keep this pretty short because people don't necessarily wanna hear all this technical details over and over again, but I think it's more of a technical group here, so I'm not sure quite where to go with this. Let's just see, Let's see if we have a plan here. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to talk about the linear distortion quote unquote problem. What does that mean? And then the solution, one solution being low distortion projections. And of course, I'll talk about the Kansas Regional Coordinate System, which is a system of low distortion projections. I'll explain what map projection distortion is in some more detail. I'll talk about the, a summary of the design process for a KRCS and the results, the analysis results. I'm also going to talk about the new datums in 2022, if you haven't heard about them, you're, you're going to hear about them. And you'll say, oh my gosh, new datums, and we just do this coordinate system? What the heck? We'll talk about that. And then some resources for using the KRCS. And then at the end, questions, comments, and discussion. But it doesn't have to be at the end. I think it's better if something's really bugging you, just go ahead and speak up now. It gets everybody more involved and engaged. It doesn't bother me anyway. In fact, I like that. But again, we want to kind of keep it sort of short. So. Here's the problem. Map distance does not equal ground distance. It's due to linear distortion. It's often, often called the grid versus ground problem. Engineers and surveyors call that. And to a lot of lay people, it doesn't even make sense. How can there be more than one distance for between two points? We'll get to that. So it is a problem for some things um, when you have a projected, projected coordinates to make a map say in a engineering construction plans where the distances might not be the same as what you measure on the ground or survey plats and legal descriptions, as-built surveys and facilities management, all these things where you might expect the distances being represented in the projected coordinates to be equal to what you measure on the ground. So what do you do? Well, the solution is you just go to your favorite computer program, right? And you just click that ground coordinates button and it's done. That's it, right? So let's see what happens. That's it. Any questions? <laughs> Told you I'd keep it short. Uh, obviously, there's going to be more to this. I flew all the way out here from Arizona not just to do that. Okay, let's get going on it. That's some little things I added. Okay, so what is the solution to the distortion problem? Well, let's make the map distance equal to ground distance. That's pretty simple, right? Only trick is it's impossible. Sort of a problem there. There's no such thing as ground coordinates, even though you saw it on that button I showed you on the previous slide. And even though surveyors, surveyors and engineers might use that terminology, there is no such a thing. But we can minimize that distortion, and that's what we'll be talking about quite a bit. And one way to do it is these things called low distortion projections. And basically, at least as I'm talking about here, it's uh, existing map projection types. It's nothing new. It's projection types that are supported in your software already. They have to be conformal. I won't talk about that in any more detail unless you really want me to. Certain kind of projections. Basically what that means is the distortion is the same in every direction around a point. You need to have that characteristic to minimize distortion. And there's only a few, it turns out, that work for this, for at least for large scale mapping. And we use two of them for the uh, Kansas regional system here. And I'll get to those as well, but there's just really there's basically four choose from. And I'll hit on all of those. So let's real, let's go ahead and jump, jump to it right now. Here it is. This is the Kansas Regional Coordinate System. Okay, let's see. That's a TV screen, but my laser pointer still God, doesn't work. It works sort of. Okay. But anyway, there it is with the 20 zones. The whole idea is we're re minimizing distortion everywhere. Now we're going to see a lot of maps like this, so let's get used to what's on here. Green is good. So green means the distortion is within plus or minus 10 parts per million. That's a tenth of a foot per mile. A tenth of a foot per mile is a very small amount. That's, a kind of, that's a small enough that you can't really detect it with standard 
terrestrial survey methods. So in effect, your ground distances and grid distances are the same. Now, as we get away from that, you get up to plus or 10 to 20 parts per million on either side, positive or negative, and I'll get to what all those mean. 10 to 25, and then this last one is the 25 parts per million negative and positive. So you're looking on this map, the whole state, 99.998% of the state is within plus or minus 25 parts per million or about 16 hundredths of a foot per mile. So that's low distortion for the whole state. It took 20 zones to do it, and again, I'll get to that. But I want to show you this first so we can all sort of get on the same page about what the problem is and what, a possible, what the possible solutions are. And why do this in the first place? Right? Why bother with this? Why not just use state plane? They already made it. Right? Let's just use that. You can. You absolutely can. But the reason this has come up, and it comes up all over the country, is state plane distortion is a little too big for a lot of applications. So people do things to make it, to reduce that distortion. And I'm guessing that was done by the DOT here, where you'd scale state plane up to ground. See some, any nodding heads out there. And you can do that, but, and I won't get into, the, unless you want to later on today, get into liabilities of doing that. So anyway, there's that. There's state plane. Well, there's not just state plane. There's also this, I guess, pretty new statewide Lambert conformal conic projection here, that, that one there, Kansas, Kansas DOT. There's also another one that's also a Kansas DOT Lambert, I guess. I called it old, but I have two definitions on there, and I'll show you more about that. And then there's a, a classic favorite for some people, universal transverse Mercator. Some of you know what these are. Some of you might not. Let's take a look at them, though. Here's the state, sort of a topo map of the state colorized. And I'm just showing the two state plane zones, right? The north zone and the south zone. What we're going to do is focus on sort of, well, I forgot I was going to show something else on here. Also high points and low points in the state. Your high point, as you all I'm sure know, is Mount Sunflower. You need oxygen to go there, right? Bottled oxygen. But it's 4,000 feet elevation, but it's height above the reference ellipsoid, which we'll get to, is a little bit less. It's a little bit less than 4,000 feet. The low point in the state is, um, if I say that right, the Vertigris. Did I say it right? Vertigris River. Um, again, 680 feet. Our ellipsoid height, 580 feet. Gives you an idea. So that's the highs and the lows. Great Bend is which we'll look at, it, for example, is a little more on the low than the high, but you get an idea. 1,800 feet, roughly, either way for the elevation or the ellipsoid height. So that's what we'll look at, Great Bend. Take a real simple situation, a, a perfect section, right? Exactly one square mile. And that, this is the actual distance. Let's say it's a perfect mile, 5,280.00 feet. And I'm representing it here in state plane. The state plane distance along that line is shorter by 63 hundredths of a foot. It's a little bit shorter. And another way of saying that is in parts per million. It's negative 119 parts per million distortion. Is that a lot or is that a little? Well, it kind of depends on what you're doing. Well, let's just look at other things. <laughs> it doesn't look like it changed anything. Watch, I'm going to click back. The only thing that changes is the title, right? State plane. Here's that statewide Lambert, the old one. Look, I got exactly the same numbers. Isn't that weird? I'll show you a picture of that. that surprised me. I was going to use this example and show all these things. And I said, oh my god, how am I going to explain this? But I can. Same distortion if you use the statewide Lambert, the old one. I don't know what its formal name is. If anybody knows, um, you can tell me. And then here's the new statewide Lambert. I put 2011 on it because that seems to be associated with its name. Now it's, it's a little more distortion. It's short by 1.23 feet. So that are 233 parts per million, again, short. And then uh, UTM's even more so, short by two and a half feet or 480 parts per million. So there's the distortion on an example for one mile. Again, so that's 2.53 feet per mile. Now I'm going to show you maps of that distortion so you get an idea how it is all over state, because that's just one point. Oh, forgot. Here's the regional. Uh, KRCS, the distortion is only three hundredths of a foot per mile or neg negative six parts per million. And that's the first map I'll show. So this is what I would call low distortion. It's almost the grid and ground distances are nearly equal. You could not detect that with, uh, say, a total station. Here again is that same map. Here's Great Bend, right? See, it's right there in the green. I said that was negative six parts per million in there. 
And again, looking at all of the state, you see that 68% of the state is within plus or minus 10 parts per million. That is very low distortion. And then 99% is within 20 parts per million, or two tenths of a foot per mile. Now going switching maps. This is state plane distortion. Okay, the colors had to change here because there's so much more distortion. At the black is essentially a negative one foot per mile right here. And then it gets decre decreasing the negative distortion until we get to this green band. You'll see that if you work in state plane and you're down in Arkansas City, you have very low distortion. It's down within that plus or minus 20 part per million band. Same as if in your south zone and you're working up in here, which is not too far south of where we are right now. Or in the north zone working way up here, you get low distortion. Everywhere else is pretty high, which is why people scale up state plane. Now, the interesting thing is, I'm going to change this map. Now, you see the pattern of colors. Here's Great Bend. It's right on the edge. It's just outside that orange. It's right on the edge between um, about, about 120 parts per million. If I switch to the statewide Lambert, the old one, look, it's the same kind of spot. Everything changed, but here it is again, just outside the orange, just outside 120 parts per million. I made this map like a day or two ago because I wanted to show what the distortion would be for this old coordinate system. Old, old, I don't know quite what that means. I didn't realize until I made that it, that it appears, and someone tell me if they know this, it appears that someone made the effort to minimize distortion at the topographic surface for this projection, not at the ellipsoid. Does that sound familiar? I'm looking for heads nodding or anything out there. Anybody know? Because it was interesting. The minimum and maximum distortion are almost perfectly balanced, and the mean distortion is near zero. That's for that statewide. Now, there's a lot of distortion, but the average distortion is low. Now, contrast this one with this new statewide projection, where you have a big band of very high distortion in the middle. Everything that's black is more than a foot per mile. Now, this distortion, this one was done 4K dot by people from um, EPSG. Does that sound familiar? European Petroleum Survey Group. Okay. And this one, where the distortion is minimized with respect to the ellipsoid, not with topography. That's why we're seeing so much more distortion here. Topography is higher than the ellipsoid. Carrying on, just to make it complete, here's UTM. This is why you don't want to use UTM necessarily, especially if you're way over here, right? Very high positive distortion. There's a big black band in the middle of a very negative distortion. So just to give you an idea. We'll see a lot more maps like that. So why bother with these LDPs, if you're not convinced already? Um, one thing is, the first thing up there says rigorously and well-supported. Rigorously defined and well-supported. That means they use standardized map prediction definitions. They're supported in virtually all geospatial software, I mean, if you choose an appropriate projection. And it si simultaneously satisfies the needs of surveying, engineering, and GIS. You can all work with the same data without having to do anything weird, like scale things up, rubber sheet things around, just use it directly. Well, actually, it's, these two are kind of the same. Enables direct use of survey data in a GIS. So if you can take your survey data, deliver it to the GIS, and they can just hit the add button, and it just shows up in the right spot. You don't have to do anything. And I mean, you don't have to do anything. Right? Hit that button. The fourth one maybe is counterintuitive. Reduces proliferation of local systems. So wait a second. We have two state plane zones. Now you just gave us 20 KRCS zones. How does that reduce the proliferation? Well, actually it does because without the system like this, you end up making a coordinate system for every single uh, engineering project, right? Every project has a coordinate system. And it's usually, typically, probably the same here in Kansas, state plane scaled to ground, which is your, the GIS won't understand. So all these complications. And that leads to the next item, facilitates data transferability. Because you standardize standardized de definitions, you can just give the data to somebody else. Nowadays, coordinate systems are usually embedded in the data. So again, they can just use it directly. And the last one, optimally minimizes distortion over the area of interest. That's really the driver here in a lot of ways. Because there's different ways to reduce distortion. But there is a best way. There is a, I guess you can say, well, you, well, you can optimally minimize it. It's an optimization problem. It's not just a real straightforward thing necessarily. And we'll see a little more of that. On that bottom part there, look, if you're going to do this sort of thing, and I've seen this before already, if you're going to do this sort of thing and make a coordinate system and have everybody use it and say, look, I got a new coordinate system, let's use it, 
it's really worth the effort to do a good job because people don't like to change their coordinate systems. Why? If you make one that's wonky, people start using it, they get pretty upset if they have to change it, even if it is wonky. That happens a lot. So it is good and it is worthwhile to take the time to do it correctly. Just to so, so you know, you're not alone. Other people have been doing this sort of thing. There's the brand new one, Kansas, right here. But they're popping up all over. Here's the one uh, Mike mentioned, Iowa Regional Coordinate System. I did participate in that one. Another one that's um, interesting is the Oregon one, a statewide one. But there's these two, Minnesota and Wisconsin, have actually been around for a long, long time, probably 30 years. And, and they're basically county-based. This is a brand new one, Indiana. It's basically county-based. And there's others. This is by no means all. There's others scattered around, but these are officially recognized by government agencies is the, is the thing. Even Alaska's gotten into it, right? They got these zones scattered all over the place, even way out, way out there on the Aleutians. So there's a lot of them out there, and they seem to be growing in popularity now. Okay, a little bit about distortion. I say GPS and map projections up here. Everyone, people knew about map projection distortion before GPS came along. It wasn't GPS that changed everything in a way, but it did do something important. GPS took something that used to be hard, geodetic serving, and made it easy. You basically push a button, you get geodetic coordinates. Those coordinates have to be transformed or converted into something that you can print on a map, a view on a computer display. And usually that's done with a quote unquote map projection. Now there's a lot of different ways to take latitude and longitude and turn it into Y and X or northing and easting, but a formal map projection is probably the most common method. And you have to do it, right? Have to do it if you want to print the map, you want to look it on a computer display, you want to use it in CAD, anything. It has to be converted into some type of projection. And those projections are always distorted. It's just a fact of life. It's not like as computers get better, better at computing things that we can make the distortion smaller and smaller because computers are more powerful. It has nothing to do with that. It's just the nature of reality. Some things just are. Right? There's death, taxes, and map projection distortion. All right? Right? Those, I'm serious. It's just the nature of reality. We can't get rid of it, but we can reduce it. And I want to emphasize here that it's not the same as error in the normal, normal sense of the word. It's a computable quantity. I can quantify the amount of distortion at a point. It's not this random error sort of thing. People sometimes think that, but it's not. But it's still an effect. I, did, I used to say not the same as error, and I changed it to random error, because it is an error. It depends on how you define error, because it's, it's an error if you say it's supposed to represent a ground distance, and it really doesn't. That is an error of, of a type. OK, now we'll take a little tour into map projections, just sort of in general. Get everybody on the same page. I've got these little globes up here with projection surfaces. And they call them projections. It's a, why? Because you can think of them as light rays being projected out from uh, some kind of source, light source, a light bulb. First one over here is actually a real projection. It's called a gnomonic projection because evidently that's how gnomes living at the center of the Earth would see the Earth. Right? They look out and they see it like that. It's projected onto that plane. That is a real type of projection. It's not conformal, though. Another one that you can construct uh, graphically is to move that light source to the opposite side of the globe and makes a stereographic projection. That one is conformal, by the way. And then this last one, you could there's infinite number of these things. In fact, speaking of infinite, that's the light source at infinity. That's an orthographic projection. All these different kinds of existing projections. Now, this whole exercise, even though despite the word projection, despite me drawing little light rays on here, you can't construct most projections this way. It's a mathematical operation. There are no, you can't plot it on a piece of paper and draw little rays and make a map and all that. It doesn't work that way. But it is great for illustrating concepts. Now, these three you can, but very few. And only for the, only for the sphere can you do this, not for the ellipsoid. So going on with this, uh, when I showed you that cartoon, I was kind of like this picture here. I put a, a plane on t the top of the Earth. And that is a specific kind of type of projection called planar azimuthal. And I can actually put that plane anywhere, right? Here's an oblique aspect. And the conformal version of that is called stereographic. Or another kind of surface I can use for projections is a cone, right? I can put a cone on the Earth kind of like a dunce cap, and it just touches it on one parallel, sits on there. Or I can have it cut 
through the ellipsoid too. It's called secant when it cuts through, and then it has two parallels where it cuts through the Earth ellipsoid. And that's, for example, Kansas State Plain is that way. That's two developable surfaces. The third one is the cylinder. The classic one over here is the regular Mercator, a cylinder that touches the Earth at the equator. Used for navigation charts. Turn it 90 degrees, you get a transverse Mercator projection, which is one we used the most of all for uh, KRCS. That's also used for state plane, conformal. And obviously, you could imagine you can rotate that cylinder any way you want, right? And make it into an oblique aspect, or one is called the oblique Mercator, and that is used for one state plane zone, that's the panhandle of Alaska. So these two are used in state plane also, not that one. Too much distortion. What is distortion? So I've talked about that. I think you're getting an idea for it. It's one of the, it's a, a, a difference between, if I take, well, this is not really the formal definition, but if I take two points that are projected and I inverse the distance between those projected coordinates, the difference in that distance between the, between that distance and the true distance, horizontal distance between those points is distortion. So I can say it as a ratio of distorted length to true length. Say, feet of distortion per mile, or millimeters of distortion per kilometer, which is the same as parts per million. And you'll hear me use parts per million a lot. And it can be negative or it can be positive. If it's negative, that grid or projected distance is shorter than the ground distance, the true distance. And if it's positive, it's longer. Pictures are better, right? So I've got the ellipsoid here. And here's a... a Developable surface, That's the, that could be the edge of a cone on edge or a cylinder or a plane itself. Seek it meaning it cuts through the ellipsoid, right? This is the standard way they're defined for most published coordinate systems. And this thing called the projection axis, um, which for um, a Lambert projection is the central parallel for a transverse Mercator is a central meridian. Now here's the situation. So you, again, you can imagine light rays. Imagine I've got light rays coming out of the Earth that pass through the ellipsoid and project this distance on the ellipsoid onto the plane. So right, right here, I guess I probably have more come on here. Yeah, sorry about that. Sometimes the animation is just not worth it. Anyhow, I'm not sure what will happen when I hit the button next. But what I'm trying to show here, and just in words, is out here, my grid distance is, is longer than my, in this case, ellipsoidal distance. My, pos my distortion is positive. And here, Distortion is negative. It's shorter than ellipsoid distance. And the whole idea behind these secant projections is it's trying to balance the magnitude of positive and negative distortion. And it just turns out, unless you go really far north, um, that 71% of that surface is, you can think of it as below the ellipsoid, and 14.5% on either side is outside. And that balances the distortion. That's why we use these secant projections, say, for state plane and UTM and all these ones that cover very large areas. And the way it's classically talked about is distortion with respect to the ellipsoid, like I've shown here. But, you know, I don't have to make it secant. I can make it tangent. I can just touch it at one place. But you can see what happens. When I do that, all the distortion is positive, right? If I do that, the distortion is really positive. Right? I, can put, I can put that plane or that surface anywhere. Why would I put it way up there? Ground is. Ground's not down. Ellipsoid, you, ellipsoid is not sea level, but it's close worldwide. It's within a few hundred feet of sea, sea level. So you can think of it that way. We used to call it that for NAD 27 and all, but that was, that, those, are, those days are gone. But that's why. That's why we put that surface up there. And looking at here again, so I've got my secant. Projection surface, ellipsoid distances, and all that business. Let's go ahead and try to represent this. So this is what I was saying before, but now it's on the slide. Grid distance is less, less than ellipsoid distance. Distortion is less than zero. Here it is. Grid distance is greater. Distortion greater than zero. And now up here, what I've tried to do is represent, this is kind of a hard thing to do, represent horizontal ground distance. It's horizontal with respect to ellipsoid. So you can think of the ground distance as the distance between two points at their average ellipsoid height. It's parallel to the ellipsoid. That's kind of what I've tried to draw here. So that's the horizontal ground distance. So the, it's greater than the ellipsoid distance and it's greater than the grid distance. Now getting to this, the general approach in designing these things. I said it before, designing them is an optimization problem because 
You're trying to cover the least distortion over the largest area. Those are mutually exclusive goals. That's all, like wanting to be tall and short at the same time. Right? It's, so how do you do this? You, that's what, where optimization comes in, and that's where you get into an iterative process. You'll see that how that works to some degree as we go through this. So as far as the KRCS goes, the way the problem was approached is getting more and more detailed, I guess, as you went down. First, took the entire state and essentially used township centers on a, so a six-mile grid over the entire state, plus towns and county centroids, but that was mainly it for the whole state, and started divvying that up and trying to calculate the distortion um, and figuring out the best way to make the least number of zones with an acceptable amount of distortion. And then as we went further along, broke it down to one arc minute grid, which is about a mile spacing for the intermediate design. And final design went all the way down to a nine arc second grid. That's about 900 feet. So you can think 900 foot uh, points on a 900 foot grid over the entire state, computing the distortion, all those points for the design. And then at the end, checking all that with the final grid, which is about 300 foot spacing over the whole state. So we got a really fine grained resolution on minimizing distortion. And actually, the parameters changed in every single step, including that last one. See that. So as far as more specifically for KRCS, the goal was to achieve 20 parts per million distortion. That's a tenth of a foot per mile, and one part in 50,000 over to 99% of the state. That was the goal. And we decided to limit it to the transverse Mercator and Lambert conformal conic projections, okay, which are, are logical choices, actually. And then as far as number, extent, and distribution of zones, we wanted to, early, actually before uh, KDOT even contacted me, the decision was made to aggregate counties, essentially, not to do individual counties. There's 105 counties, right? So that'd be a lot of zones. So some states have elected to do that. So aggregate them, like state plain. Minimize number of zones, the, the scope was up to 25. We were thinking we could get it within 20, and we did get it to 20. And other things, like we didn't want zone boundaries to go right through the middle of cities and things like that. That would be awkward. And try to have some overlap between zones. Um, idea will be referenced in the North American data of 1983. That is using the GRS-80 ellipsoid for the projection, projected coordinates. And the last thing, stakeholders involved in the design process. Um, Mike talked about this some already. That's a really important part. All this technical mumbo jumbo that I can talk all day about doesn't mean anything if people don't agree that that's what they want to do. Yeah, we can do math. We can design whatever we want. But if no one wants to use it, it's a waste of time. So establishing that groundwork up front is really important. And keeping people involved and engaged through the process is really important, too. And we made every effort to do that. And it, may, it, it does make a difference. Now, we some constraints for the state. Um, uh, we saw it earlier in a slide, but the topo heights range from about 600 to 4,000 feet. That's 3,400 feet. The state w is 200 miles wide, roughly north-south, 400 miles roughly east-west. So those are sort of the geometric constraints we're working in. And the implied distortion due to those two things, as far as height goes, if it's just height alone, if, forget about earth curvature, I can have, I can have an 800-foot change in height and keep my distortion within 20 parts per million. Well, with that change in height, just due to height, I would need five zones at least for the state. But there's curvature, too. The Earth curves. It falls away from you in every direction. So for 20 parts per million there, you can get a zone about 70 miles wide due to curvature. So I'd need three zones in north-south bands or, or north, six zones in east-west bands just due to curvature. So I'm already accumulating a pretty big number. You can't really tell from that, but you start to get a feel that it's going to be more than five zones, things like that. Remember, both height and curvature affect distortion. There's the state again. I have, now I have contours of topographic ellipsoid height. You see there's a 1,000-foot contour over here and a 4,000-foot one just outside the boundary. Now let's look. And I'll show you another cartoon about this, because this, this part actually really affects the design a lot. But, for the entire state, it slopes up with respect to the ellipsoid from east to west by about 0.13 percent. It's not a whole lot, but it's something to think about. We, we will think about it. Now, it's not uniformly distribu distributed across the state. On the eastern half, it's pretty flat. It slopes up about 0.07 percent. In the western half, it gets steeper as you go west. It's up to 0.2 percent. Those don't sound like big numbers. 
But when it comes to doing these projections, you'll see that it makes a big difference. And you'll see why there's all the zones in the western part of the state are transverse Mercator projections, not Lambert conformal conic. In fact, let's go back to the cartoon. I just made this cartoon this morning, so I hope it works. So that's not in the, sorry. Back to our cartoon, the ellipsoid topographic surface. So the situation in Kansas is kind of over here, let's say. Say that this is going out towards the Rocky Mountains. Your slope, if this is, if this is west and this is east, the topography is sloping up from east to west, right? So I have a situation here where there's, let's call that a horizontal ground distance. It's kind of fun because when I shine up here, it goes on the ceiling. I keep looking at that. Um, anyway, it projects the ellipsoid, projecting up, let me just re say it. There's a representative of a horizontal ground distance. I don't really care about the ellipsoidal distance. So the thing to do would be to put a projection surface, not just through here, but create the projection surface so that it slopes at the same rate as the topography, right? See what I'm doing? I didn't put the projection axis here. I put it off to the east. I put it off to the east to make that plane tilt up so that it was parallel to topography. That was the, that's what happened. You'll see that. On the, when you look at those handouts with the nice big printed maps, you'll say, you'll see a lot of those zones where the transverse Mercator projection is. The central meridian is not central in the zone. It's off to the east, just like I'm showing here. And that's why, because the topography is sloping up to the west. And then, I forgot to get that one up there. So grid distance, the idea here is the grid distance and the ground distance are approximately equal. Distortion is nearly zero, because it's right there, next, overlying, if you will, the horizontal ground distance. That worked pretty well. Kind of messed up the animation a little bit. So as far as preliminary design, well, I just told you this. Ellipsoidal heights generally increase from est, east to west. The increase is greater in the western half of the state. That means I knew from the get-go the Lambert conformal conics. I tried some out west anyway, but I knew they wouldn't work very well. Um, anyhow, so I calculated ellipsoid heights for all the topography, and I mentioned before what I used for design points. 3,600 design points, mostly township centroids, but also towns and county centroids and end up with 23 initial preliminary designs. Now what I'm going to do now is we're going to look at every single one of them and you guys are going to, we're going to pass out a sheet and you grade them, rate the ones you like best. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to show you some quick pictures to show you kind of the iterations that we're going through with this. It's a lot more than what I'll show up here. Just give you an idea. Oh, for one thing, here is the grid. This is the initial design grid. So it's all these township centroids. And the, the, big, the bigger gray diamonds are the county centroids, and then uh, a thousand or so towns. So those were all the design points initially. So the very first iteration, so we tried for this. I tried a, a zone that was the full length of the state for going, including Selena. Tried a Lambert out here just for the heck of it, just to see what would happen. And some other things. Here's one that overlaps with Selena for Wichita and Arkansas City, and one over here that's pretty big. So there's one. Now I'm going to click the slide. You'll see them change around a little bit. There's different ones here. That Actually, this one, these change quite a bit. This one changed. That one changed to transverse Mercator. Tried another really long one right here. Tried it again. Just trying different things. And, then, and kind of ended up with this. Okay, This is not quite the same. This is close, but really not quite. I was always trying to make them as big as possible. So this was the initial design. There's 13 zones on here. We didn't use this because that's an unlucky number. You can't have 13 zones. Everybody knows that. So anyway, this was the initial design. We took a look at that. So once we had that, it turned out, I thought the west half of the state would be easier, but it decided to work on the, it looked like the east half was actually easier. So it started working on that. So we looked at that, tried to 22 different permutations of those nine, eight or nine eastern zones, depending on how you, which one you look at. Um, Used a one arc minute grid, then chopped it down on a nine arc second grid, and ended up with two alternatives, which I'll show right now. One had eight zones, one had nine zones. So, and they're, very, they're exactly the same otherwise. This is one of them, where um, Kansas City, Topeka, and Manhattan are all in one zone. The only difference between this one and this one is splitting that into two zones. And that was, if I go back, there's quite a bit of positive distortion down here, and thought it'd be nice, and also, we just thought it'd be better to have lower distortion in this big metropolitan area. So 
by chopping that in half, we could do that. So that was the eastern half of the state. Sort of settled on that. West half of the state, there were 19 permutations we tried. Same thing with using finer and finer grids. And ended up with four alternatives, going from seven to eight to nine, and finally 11 zones. And real quickly, just show you pictures of that, because it's better than words. So here's the lowest number of them, and it's kind of funky. Stand back here, see what you see. So I got this great big one for Great Bend, right? That was the whole length of the state. I got this huge one here going the whole length. I got this one here for Garden City. And uh, I don't know, it's just kind of weird, right? I, so I've got, and is the distortion too high? Well, yeah, maybe. Is the, the statistics are on here. I've still got, I've got 97% within plus or minus 20 parts per million. So I'm getting quite a bit of positive distortion in here. So let's chop that one into two. So now, okay, oh, good, good, I got rid of that. Now I'm up to 97.9% within 20 parts per million. It looks like I could chop this one in half too. Okay, so now I've got it. I've got uh, nine nine zones now, and that's getting better. I mean, 98% within 20 parts per million. And this one looks all right, um, but it's just, you know, I could reduce the distortion here, but more importantly, this break. Um, is kind of odd. So we ended up with this one. You see what happened? I split both these zones in half. This one I didn't really need to distortion wise, but it's just so long and skinny that we decided to go with this one. This is this is what we ended up choosing in the end. This one with um, 11 zones. So we have 11 zones in the west, nine zones in the east for the total of 20 that we ended up with. And I've at the 98.8% within 20 parts per million here, 99% that. Okay, so that was going through all the distortion part of it, which is the important part. Well, it's it's all important, but that's what we're after, performance. But there's other things you have to deal with, like how do you want to number them? Do you want to number them um, as you read from left to right, or do you want to number them boostrophodonically? Who knows what that means? Somebody's got to. As the ox plows, right? That's the way sections are numbered in the township. We could have done that just because we're, we like that sort of thing. But anyway, we ended up doing left to right. Zone names were issues. Ended up just using the largest city in the zone for the name. Seemed to make the most sense. Then other things. Just decided to define the parameters in U.S. survey feet rather than, say, meters. Make sure the coordinates are different from the state plane, UTM, and those state Lamberts, so they're very unique from that. Positive values everywhere because people hate negative coordinates. And northings and eastings not equal to each other anywhere inside a zone. So you can look at the, you can tell which is a north and an east just from the value. More to that, more on projected coordinate values. Remember, th those have no effect on distortion. So for easting, I ended up choosing, for all the eastings are greater than a million feet. And it's set up so that, well, it says up there, the false easting, which it would be the easting, say, in the middle of your zone, central meridian zone, equals the zone number times one million plus 500,000. That's so it won't go ne won't drop down to the next level of millions as you go west. So that any time you're in the zone, your feet in millions of feet is the zone number. Okay, that's how it was set up that way. So we go through all there. So if you see, if you have 1.5 million feet, you know you're in zone one. If you're in 19.2 million feet, you know you're in zone 19. Northings, we wanted to keep them less than a million feet. The problem is the state is more than a million feet north-south. So we broke the state into two tiers, a north and a south tier, and made sure that they were, they differ by about 300,000 feet in the tiers from each other. They're never closer together in values than that. And they're they're larger numbers in the north tier than in the south tier, so you can sort of tell. But the northings are not unique. Only the eastings are. But then, and the northings and the eastings are never equal. And the northings are always less than a million feet everywhere in the state. And just to help you be able to look at the numbers and have an idea of what's going on. OK, so we have the preliminary designs. We have those names. We know how we want to define the parameters and, and all that business. So we got to finalize designs. As I already mentioned, we selected 20 zones. From there's what we call alternative number two with nine zones and alternative number four with 11 zones. And then did that final analysis at three arc second 
resolution, which is about 300 feet. And actually changed a few of them. So these seven zones changed a little bit. I'll, I'll show you a picture of that right now so you, this is easier than words. So here are those two alternatives, right? These are the 20 zones. And what I'm going to do, actually, you can pick any one of those seven zones. You don't know which they are right now because you didn't memorize what was on that slide because I clicked way too fast. Rotten that way. Well, we can go back and forth. But just look at Wichita zone here. It's going to change a little bit if you watch it. And then we can look at the others too. But I'm going to click it and the little red circles will go over the zones that change. So click. So I'm going to do that again. 17. See how it's positive distortion got reduced. So negative distortion got increased. Same with Arkansas City. Those two zones, basically we reduced the positive distortion a little bit. So this seemed like a better thing to do. And that's all that happened all these. All these ones that are red circles, these are the ones that changed. We're talking one part per million. This is just that little final tweak to get things how we want them. But this is the final design here. That is the one on the handouts. And that's the one where we got didn't quite hit 99%. We got 98.8% of the state within 20 parts per million. Yes, sir? Well, don't follow the category, don't follow the category. Yes. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And that was very much by intent. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like state plane in that sense. State plane does the same thing. Its general rule in state plane is that zone boundaries are aggregated counties. And we did the same thing here because we could. The topography is subdued enough in Kansas that we can do that sort of thing. We couldn't do it in Oregon. It's just there's no way. Places like that. But here you can. And we did it in Iowa, too. Design results. So 20 zones for 105 counties. The number of counties per zone ranges from 3 to 10. There's six Lambert conformal conic projections and 14 transverse Mercator. I don't know how you feel about that. That was a funny thing for me, by the way, being in this business. I don't know if it's an emotional attachment, but when people are in a Lambert state, they want to use Lambert projections. When people in a transverse Mercator state, they want to use transverse Mercator projections, but it doesn't really matter. The computer does everything. You don't, I never understood that. But anyhow, you have both for what it's worth. And as far as performance goes, the minimum in the whole state is negative 26.9, maximum is negative, positive 26.0, and the mean is negative four, standard deviation for what it's worth, plus or minus eight. But here's the performance, and 68% of the state is within 10 parts per million, 99% is within 20, essentially 100, 99.998% is within 25 parts per million. So we've achieved low distortion everywhere in here, in all, the, all areas of all zones. And I'm going to click back, because I didn't put this in any of the slides, but if I remember right, the max, maximum positive distortion is right here inside the Atchison zone, right at its south boundary. And the maximum negative distortion is, I think it's right there, right there on the edge of this Coffeeville zone. So those are the spots, but that's right. It's all, remember, it's all gradual, right? The distortion just gradually increases, and yeah, it gets up to, say, 25, 26 parts per million, but just barely, just barely gets there. I didn't make a slight one, one thing, I mentioned it earlier, is we wanted to have some overlap between the zones. So in other words, if you were working near the boundary of a zone, you could cross over to the next zone and keep working. That was the idea. And we wanted to have, say, six-mile buffers for all the zones. Well, it turns out, in order to keep it down to 20, you can't quite always do that. It depends on which direction you're going. Let me, let me, let me, in the bit, I'll, let me hold off on that and show you something. It's in all your maps. So, if you have a handout of the maps, you look at those maps, it shows the zone, and then in a uh, kind of a, a white line all the way around it, there's a polygon with a six-mile buffer, so you can see six miles outside the zone, how it performs. You'll see that for transverse and Mercator zones, you can go a long ways north and south outside the zone and still get good performance. Likewise, with Lambert's, but the opposite's not true. When you go east and west from a transverse zone, it falls off pretty fast. Depends on the zone, but it gives you an idea. And then you might, that might, might govern a choice. If you are working, let's say you're working here near the boundary of Kansas City and Pittsburgh zones, 
you say, if you if you use the Kansas City zone and you go very far south, the distortion is going to increase pretty rapidly. You can say, oh, well, even though my project is mostly in Kansas City, I'm going to use the Pittsburgh zone because this distortion stays low for a long ways north. See what I mean? You can make those decisions based on when you are close to a zone boundary. Okay, now I'll get into this. So I feel like I'm probably doing great on time. How are you guys doing? You're looking pretty good. No one is sleeping. That's excellent. Um, we're, we're, are we doing all right on time? I didn't time anything. We're good. I thought so. So I'm, I'm getting kind of kind of near the end. So I thought I'd take some time now to talk about these new 2022 datum. So since in my, in my day job, I work for the National Geodetic Survey, I have to ask, how many people know about these new datums? Right? This time, do raise your hand if you know. Does, and nobody in here knows? Mark knows? Nobody? Really? God, we're doing a terrible job of advertising this. Okay, holy smokes. Hey, let me collect, let me gather myself. Think about this for a second. So, I realize some of you might have been shy and not want to raise your hands, but still. In 2022, NGS is going to release new datums for the United States. There's going to be a geometric datum or so-called horizontal, classically you might call it a horizontal datum. It's actually we're calling them reference frames. And there's going to be a new vertical datum, which actually is going to be called a geopotential datum. And I can go into a whole lot of detail about this, but we're not going to right now. But we're going to go into enough so you get an idea. And do ask any questions at all. We have time. We're all friends here, right? We can do this. So in 2022, and just is going to release four terrestrial reference frames. One on top is called the North American Terrestrial Reference Frame of 2022. That'll be for all of North America, just like it sounds. That's uh, coterminous United States and Alaska. But also a Pacific Terrestrial Reference Frame. That's for not all of Pacific Ocean, but all of Pacific Ocean that's on the Pacific Plate. So that include Hawaii, American Samoa, and other places where uh, the United States has territories and interests. But also a Mariana Terrestrial Reference Frame of 2022. That's where Guam and the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands that, um, that Kim wants to nuke. That's where that is. And then, uh, we, and just so you know, just so you know, these three, we already have, NAT 83 is already defined with respect to these. There's three NAT 83s right now. There's NAT 83 for North America. There's NAT 83 for the Pacific Plate. There's NAT 83 for Mariana Plate. Why do we do that? Because it's job security. If you make it complicated, you need geodesists. Who else would employ us? No, seriously though, we've gotten so good at positioning that take, we have to take plate tectonics into account. So these frames move with the plates. Well, North American plate is rotating. Which ways are rotating? Because oh, this is west, west, east, rotating like that. The plate, this, the frame is supposed to move with the plate. Um, so that's why we do it. So we have a frame that does North America, a frame that does Pacific, a frame that does the Mariana plate. Right now, Puerto Rico which is on the Caribbean plate, is actually referenced to the North American plate, so they have pretty high velocities. Well, that's, what, that's the consequence. You can reference your coordinates to any plate on the planet. It doesn't matter, but if you want low velocities or near zero velocities, you want to be referenced to the plate on where you reside. Puerto Rico is on the Caribbean plate, so they're, they're moving pretty fast east with respect to the North American plate. But in 2022, they get their own plate. So I don't know if that'll help with their budget issues. But I don't know. Anyhow, so those are the terrestrial reference frames, and we're also and we will create a new state plane system to go along with that. Twenty state plane coordinate system of 2022, which I'm project manager for. And it may, we don't know yet. We're we're actually soliciting input. We're gonna start doing that soon, but whether that would include LDD coordinate type projections, we don't know. So it is possible that the KRCS could become a part of state plane in 2022. I'll get to that in a minute. We also have a vertical datum. This has no effect on horizontal coordinates, but it's actually called North American Pacific Geopotential Datum, not vertical. And I can talk about why. I think it's probably not a good name in a way, because people hear that and say, what are they talking about? And I'm gonna, as tempted as I am, I'm going to let that lie, unless you have questions about it. But so that's going to be functionally the vertical datum. And that's not just for North America. It's for all of everything is for the Pacific, for North America plate, for Marianas, for everywhere. That's one single datum for everything on the vertical side. <clears throat> so we had this flyer that went out. I guess you guys didn't see it. 
your NAD83 base state plan legislative coordinates will not be maintained in 2022. Do you hear me? They will not. So what do you do? Panic, ignore it, or act? So we have this thing. And we are, <laughs> we have initiated that process, but evidently we haven't reached everyone. This is an ongoing effort. We just had a geospatial summit last April. We're going to start, I think, doing those annually now and try to get more and more people involved. So there's that. So let me show you the change. We're not going to do the geopotential data, just the terrestrial reference frames. So here's the planet, in case you're not sure. And there's these big things called tectonic plates. There's a North America plate. There's a Kansas right there. Pacific plate, Cocos plate, huh, Cocos, Caribbean plate. Um, so I'm going to show you a map now of the change from NAD80. This is an estimated change from NAD83 to the new geometric reference frames. It depends on where you are. So in North America, there's a contour. These are meters. Sorry about that. 1.1, 1, 1, 1.2, 1, 1.3 meter contours going right through the middle of Kansas right there. So that's a 1.3 meter horizontal change from NAD83 to NATREF, can I call it that, NATREF 2022. This is estimated because I'm assuming a specific time with these. You see it's quite a bit different than the Pacific. Just so you know, I, I threw this in here at the last second, just swinging around to the other side of the planet. We do have, this is the, oh, I should have put an A in there, NATREF, um, for where Guam and uh, Commonwealth and Northern Mariana Islands are, and here on that little plate, the Mariana plate. And we've got, you know, we've got American Samoa down here. There's Hawaii, a bunch of islands in here. And then another part of that, that's the horizontal. The ellipsoid heights will change too by plus or minus two meters. So it's like you take the whole ellipsoid. This is what we're going to know. We take the whole ellipsoid, and in the middle of the night, when everyone's asleep, we're going to move it 2.2 meters. Right? So that's why the whole thing shifts. It's we moved it this way. Wait, no, that way. Sorry. Move it that way. So these ellipsoid heights will decrease by two meters. These will increase by two meters. And then what do we have? One meter is going right through the middle of Kansas. Negative one meter. So all ellipsoid heights will decrease by about a meter. I'll give you more numbers here. All right? So those are the changes that are coming for the reference frame. Now, how will it affect this KRCS that you just paid good money for? Talk about it. First of all, if, I don't, if you don't do anything, it'll still work. It'll be fine. It'll work. And what'll happen is the horizontal coordinates will change by 4 to 4.3 feet, depending on where you are. Lipsoid heights will decrease by 3.0 3.7 feet, again, depending on where you are. But that effect, the horizontal has no effect on distortion. This, the maximum effect from this change of lipsoid height is less than 2 tenths of a part per million decrease. So actually, distortion will improve in some places and get a little bit worse in others, but only by at worst, 0.18 parts per million. That's negligible. So it'll work fine. Now, how do you adapt to it, though? Like I said, do nothing. The system will still work. What I have proposed, actually, as part of this project, um, is you can do something about it. You can modify the false northings and eastings so that the coordinates it generates will still will be different, different enough from the existing ones that you'll be able to see the coordinates and say, oh, that's actually reference to 2022, not to NAD83, but no effect on distortion. And again, on here, this is more of the same thing. So the idea is we, we spend all that effort making all these coordinates nice so that you know you're, you can tell which zone you're in by the coordinate values and all that. The proposal is to keep that same system with the assumption that you'll still use feet, US survey feet or international feet. So you'll still get the same exact performance as far as all this goes up here. But redefine the parameters themselves in meters to nice round values. And what, what you can end up having, at least in the option that I presented as part of the project, is a, have a minimum, a minimum difference in coordinates from NAD83, KRCS reference NAD83, to KRCS 2022. A minimum difference of 33,000 feet and a maximum of 159,000 feet. So those are big enough, right, that if you plot it on a map and you're off by 33,000 feet, you can think, oh, oh, shoot, I used that. Darn that 83. Okay. So as far as this project goes, the deliverables. Um, we're pretty much to the end of the project and to the end of this presentation. 
obviously a complete system design, um, some large-scale distortion maps, which copies are available back there. Most of you should have them. Education materials, of which this is part. Um, a big set of GIS data files, including complete distortion rasters for every for for everything, shape files, that kind of thing. Um, projection files, the PRJ files, um, also other parameters for you being able to use these zones inside your CAD software, engineering software, other surveying software, and uh, scripts for the Oracle database to understand the coordinate systems, Oracle database here, K dot. And then the final part is essentially a project report, sort of a handbook and user guide about the whole thing. It'll have all the information about the system, including how to do some calculations and, co and coordinate values, distortion values for around the state, tools for you to help use it. And so about those maps, here's, you have them now, but here's, here's kind of what they look like. There's two different layouts, right? There's, well, actually there's three. There's two different kinds of um, landscape layouts. This is one here for showing for um, the Manhattan zone, to give you an idea. And this is what I'm talking about. See, this is, this is that, I don't know why you see this, but this white buffer, six mile buffer around the zone that gives you an idea how, how it performs six miles outside the zone. Because this is a Lambert projection, I can go way out east, west, and it does fine, but I can't, depends on where you are. Over here, I can go further south, but over here, it gets pretty bad pretty fast as I go south out of the zone, likewise up here. And then this one, and another one, this is also um, landscape style, but this is, this is the one where I take the whole width of the sheet. And this is the one for here, right? Here's Topeka, right there. Sort of the same situation, but actually you can, this one performs really well, because we cut that zone down small, and we were very, very thoughtful to include the other Kansas City in here, just in case they wanted to use it on the other side of the border. So they got low distortion over here in Missouri, too. And then we, because we have so many of these long, skinny zones, instead of trying to put them onto a portrait type landscape, portrait, I mean landscape type layout, we did it as um, portrait because they're so long. And here's one for zone one, and here's one for zone 20, just to give you an idea. And again, you can see on there, you can go north and south a long way and the distortion's fine, but you can't go very far east and west before the distortion gets pretty high. Now, as far as resources go, this is already up and running. This is just a screen capture from a web page for, um, for the low distortion projection. And you can go to this interactive map, click on it, and get the projection parameters or get those maps that you just saw and get the, I don't know if they're ready yet, the PRJ files. They're out the PRJ files, so you can take those. And if your software understands PRJ files, they're coordinate system files, um, you can use those. There's the link on here. <clears throat> One thing I would mention is that uh, these will be published with EPSG. Okay. Probably, these will be published with EPSG, so they'll probably, uh, well, eventually they'll lead on into kind of all the other softwares that use their database for uh, accumulating these coordinate systems and publishing them in their products. Yeah, that's, that was a good point. I, I didn't put EPSG in here sp explicitly because it wasn't part of the project scope, but. That's good. It's actually it's gotten really easy to get parameters in in the um, EPSG. They call it um, a geodetic parameter registry, and you go in there and they've got thousands upon thousands of coordinate systems to find. What's nice about it is everything's available in machine readable format. So you click on that, you can get the what is it, geography markup language version or a well-known text version of it, and it's machine readable, so your computer can understand it. And it's very, very handy. That's turned out to be super useful. And like I said, they made it, they made it easy for organizations like government organizations like this DOT could represent the state and get something defined in their registry separately from this. So here's the goal about it. I probably should have this at the beginning, right? But anyway, I put it here. The idea is to make working at ground simple, not make it hard. Do all the hard work now in developing the system so that it's easy to use. Your software automatically knows what to do. We use standard projection definitions, nothing weird. A single system covers as large areas as you can, and no spot special processes. For the, for the surveyors in the audience, that means no calibration, no localization for this stuff. Right? You just use it. This is the coordinate system definitions. As soon as you calibrate it, you broke it. Right? We can talk more about that later if you want to.
more on software. The best situation is already defined in the software. And as I said, it's available from the KRC that, um, website that I just showed, KRCS website. You get the PRJ files, the maps. Oh, and I do mention, put the EPSG in here. Um, ultimately, and it may happen fairly quickly, KRCS will be in vendor software. I know Esri's been very fast on the uptake of these coordinate systems, for example. <clears throat> if it's not in the software during this introductory period, you enter it yourself into say whatever it is you're using. Maybe your data collector, who knows? But just be careful. You know, they're numbers. I don't know about you, when I type numbers in, sometimes I mix them up by accident. But once you put them in there, check them and make sure they work. Because there's more to it. It says right here, I don't go into it all in this presentation really. Datum definitions can be tricky. You click the wrong thing there, and you can make a real mess for yourself. Okay, this part right here. Datum definitions. That's a, another topic. But you can put it in, right? Sort of follow the pattern that you already have in your data collector for how it does say state plane, and you'll be fine. Because it should have the right datum definition. Okay, back to our button. Our button's different now. It says, what, this is what we want, right? We want to be able to click that button and get it to work for us instead of this ground coordinates button. We want it to be that easy. A one-step process, and you're done. Okay, this must be the last slide. So what we've done here, we've defined a projected coordinate system for the whole state. When I say projected coordinate system, that's a date, that's a projection plus a datum plus a linear unit. Those three things together define the system. Zones correspond to county boundaries. Remember, it's purely horizontal. There's no vertical component to this at all. That's a completely separate issue. We have minimized linear distortion over the entire state, 99% is within planet plus or minus 20 parts per million or a tenth of a foot per mile. And that's, that's good. Based on existing projections, so compatible with almost all geospatial software on the market today, I don't think you'll find many exceptions. Because it just popped in my head, though, I will say this. God, I almost got through the last slide and I had to do this. Don't you hate that? Lambert conformal conic projections with a single parallel. All of the Lamberts, all six zones that are Lamberts in the system have a single parallel, not two parallels. I, I don't think any modern software has a problem with that anymore, but some older software might. If you use old software, I have a data collector with old software on it, it might not be able to handle those definitions. Now, there's workarounds, but I just want to let you know that about that. So hopefully no one will run into that issue and it won't be a problem. It's getting to be, it's getting to be pretty rare. So it's in a, getting on with this thing. Reference to NAT83, North American data in 1983, but will be compatible with 2022, but it'd be a good idea, I think, to redefine the origins. It'll still perform the same, but redefine the origins so the coordinates are at least different by a few several thousand feet or so. And that is it. kind of what I thought. I'm going to have to rephrase your question. So it's basically what are the plans for implementing the KRCS in the workflows here at KDOT? Yeah. Is that you, new coordinate systems? Basically, the survey section is going to, you want to start using it. You're going to start receiving surveys that have been done in that, assuming we have work. So anyways, uh, I mean, that'll be a natural progression into it. Um, there's probably an opportunity for you to use it just when you're just reprojecting stuff or like, in certain cases. I mean, it won't match up with your existing project coordinates, but there may be a chance for you to use it some other way. But we're going to put the we're going to put the definitions in there and publish them, so they'll be accessible. Sometimes we will reproject after you get the light 
or they didn't click what you need. You have a project specific coordinate system. Sometimes it doesn't line up like just how you want it. So you reproject it into that from the general coordinates to your specific coordinates to get it to whatever DTM boundary we might have had from our survey crew or whatever. Okay, I'm going to rephrase some of that just to help out with the anybody that's listening online yeah. and recording it. So it sounds like, for the example you used was, say, LiDAR data. Right. And you get it, sounds like, um, as a deliverable in, say, state plane coordinates. I'm not sure what you get it in. And then, you, oh, you get it in UTM? Oh, that's it, okay. Yeah. That's a good thing I had that slide up there showing how much distortion there is for UTM. Um, so you get it in that projected coordinate system, and then you'll do some sort of transformation in your software to get it into what you want, whatever that may be, a local project it coordinate system. Project specific or now maybe into these, mm -hmm. into this new well, coordinate system. Right, so it, and bec okay, if you're going from UTM, which is formally defined, and you're going to KRCS, KRCS, which is formally defined, it should just be a click of a button. Yeah. No effect on the vertical, yeah. right? And rather than a project coordinate system might be something, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I'm not sure what you deal with, but maybe you do mod a scaled up state plane. Is that most common? And other people might do other things. Okay, scaled up state plane is its own special thing, for sure. But yes, it, that's the whole idea is to get to work super simple. So you know, if you get as long as it's well defined, you should have no problem porting it over. Okay. Yeah. If you get far enough into this, that DAS data that you get may no longer be in UTM. Right. It may be in this KRCS zone. Yeah, how if you're letting. They, how they distribute it. Yeah. yeah. Either they take the existing and move it, or they, in the future, yeah. it's collected. Right. These are good questions, and, and it brings up an important thing that I, I didn't really mention in here. Nowadays, uh, the reprojection on the fly capabilities of software, are, they're incredible, right? So you can have a, in Esri speak, you can have a data frame of your area. Let's say it's in state plane, or the, let's say it's the, the, one of the Lambert's, statewide Lambert projections, and someone delivers you an engineering project in the KRCS, It'll literally be you click the add button and it'll show up in the right place. There won't be anything to do. Even though the data are referenced to the KRCS for the engineering data and say your base map data is referenced to the Lambert system, they'll still line up perfectly because the software is reprojecting it on the fly. That part works seamlessly. The hard part, which I haven't talked about, is the datum definition. That's separate from the map projection. As long as that you got that straight and it's consistent, it works seamlessly. And it really does it. And actually, it's gotten so good now that it works really well with imagery. It works with large data sets. Reproduction on the fly works really well. I'm amazed at how well it works with imagery. So you can have imagery in a completely different coordinate system than the one you're viewing, or vice versa, and it, it shows up in the right place. It works really well. Any other, any other questions or comments or jokes or anything? You're also well behaved. I'm, I'm wandering over this way. I'm not sure. How, how are we? We're doing great on time, I guess. I can't use that clock, I know. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. We're good. Ah, yes. My question might be a little bit off topic and maybe you're going to Kate out. I'll walk over here. Um, what, what is your unique, uh, what is it going to take? This makes things a lot easier, a lot simpler. Do you see more data coming out of road design compared back to road design for the same white spaces? Or do you see more data coming out of road design compared back to road design? We'll see. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, I, I, should, I, should, uh, I should ask the question. I'm sorry about that. Um, what does the KRCS mean for data sharing? Within internally in DOT between departments and data sets. I'll give you an example. Okay, planning was always always coming up to us, going, "You guys have alignments. You guys have this. You guys have that. You have it in a coordinate system, correct?" And yeah, we should be able to take that and use it. But we'll wait, we have a thing called the CAF factor. It's always been a barrier. It's like. Okay, you, I'll give you guys some data. You guys try and get it into your system and apply the CAF factor. Usually, they never heard back. <laughs> it's a piece of work. So, 
So, you know, that was kind of one of those things that was kind of happening a lot. You know, and, and people, you know, if you don't find a CAF factory, you have to go dig into the survey notes. You have to go find a, find a page. It's different in every single one because we've never created like a form that was universal. It's like, here, go find your, you just got to search through it and find it. You know, point nine 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 eight seven that whatever it is, different for every project. Uh, we couldn't even put it in microstation for years until we figured it out. You know, Mike helped figure that out with the help from somebody else. We finally, and now they're in microstation, and things got a ton better because of that. And so now you just got to know where you're working. So, you know, we're handing this stuff off. We're talking. We're going to give it to Trimble. We're going to give it to Bentley. We're going to give it to all these people. So you put it in your face library as well as giving it to that organization. That and uh, so we're hoping this stuff starts getting delivered. You know, you go to Kansas under there. You're going to see the K. ARCS. ARCS. Yeah, I <laughs> It'll roll off a tongue someday. I transpose those. <laughs> I have a bad thing about transposing things. So because um, if you look at the signature on one of the things I sent out today, I transpose that. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, well, you know, anyways, I mean, it just really, it just makes things simpler. I mean, it's one of the main reasons that we haven't delved into that. When it's eliminate that problem, it's been a headache for us for years. People come up and go, you have this. Yeah, we do, but, it's always that but. Now there's no but. That's a, I, I'm really glad this part came up because I didn't talk about um, scaling existing projected coordinate systems. So here I'm assuming you're scaling state plane, a typical project scale state plane, and they have the scale factor. Problem is, not only do you need to know the scale factor, you need to know about which point was applied. Was it at zero, zero? Was it at a point on the project? Because that makes a huge difference. And believe me, KDOT's not alone. This goes on all over the United States. So people use these scale factors to go from state plane to quote unquote ground. Now, you may ask yourself, why do people do this? Why does this happen? Why is it so common? There's a real simple answer. Because it used to be, it used to be very hard to do projected coordinates. It takes a lot of computation to do it. Computers can do it real easily now, but in the past, you wouldn't want to make your own projection. NGS made one for you, so you used it, and you just scaled it up. And that's how it was for many, many years. Because we're creatures of habit, we're used to doing it that way, we keep doing it that way. Then, you know, it's, it's a solution to a problem. Um, depends on what you're trying to do, but based on what Mark was just saying, you can see the advantages of not having to think about that. Not only will you, if someone doesn't list the zone in the KRCS they're in, you can look at the coordinates and tell what zone they're in. So it should be, the whole idea is to make it transparent. Obviously having all the metadata helps, but to try to make it as foolproof as possible is part of the process. So no more looking through notes or sheets to try to find a scale factor. Glad you said that, that was good. I was wondering, uh, when KDOT, or the state of Kansas, yeah, here. convert the GRCS to the new datum, 2022 20, datum, what kind of uh, effort is that? Do we need to be getting on your list ahead of time? Uh, there's a lot of trickle down into all the other systems that this is going to be based on. Well, as far as, t so I guess I can answer part of it, maybe all of it. Um, so the. The, the datums are changing, right? Now, you don't have to. NGS is not a regulatory agency. We don't require people to use our coordinate systems. Federal agencies are who are required to use the National Spatial Reference System. But we, the, everyone else seems to want to use it because one thing, they have to interact with federal agencies. So I'm saying that because it's not like they flip the switch and you have to be on the new system. You could stay on the system for a while and you can plan a change for it so you can accommodate it yourselves. You know, you don't have to switch it overnight. Now, as far as we did come up with a method for migrating to 2022 that would be as painless, I think as painless as possible, like keeping keeping all the hard work that we did on the system, not perpetuating it, but making the coordinates different. That's basically what it amounts to. What is to be interesting, though, is if KRCS disappears and becomes part of state plane in the future. That's a possibility. I don't know if that's going to happen. What it, what, it may re, what it may require, this hasn't been decided, what it may require is that the state of Kansas decides what they want. If Kansas, it may be either or. You can either have the state plane like you had before with two zones or one zone or something like that, 
or you can use KRCS, but not both. I don't know if that's the case or not, but that's a possibility. And if you just choose the 20 zones of KRCS, that would become your state plane if that's what you want. So it's a, it's a statewide decision. And again, I don't know. We'll know a lot more in about a year once we get some input. Did that? Well, I'm going to come back, and I'm the guy with the microphone now. That's a funny little microphone. How, how is the GPS system going to change in 2022? Oh, I'm not with the Department of Defense, so I can't answer that. So GPS won't be – so GPS doesn't do anything with this stuff. So this is actually a good question. So I'm going to follow up on it a little bit more. Um, can I ask you a follow-up question? Why'd you ask the question? I mean, uh, well, as, as GPS currently, we're giving it a, a WGS 84 coordinate datum. Uh, mm -hmm. So will we be will they, will they be adjusting that for the 2022? I'm I'm glad you asked that question. So I think you heard it. I had the microphone. I'm so will GPS change as a consequence of going to the 2022 datums? The answer is no. It will not. So. The, the, this gets into one of the things I can really talk a long time about, so I'm going to try to restrain myself. You said WGS84. That is the official reference frame for um, GPS, and there's been six different versions of it. We're on number six, and there'll be a number seven. And what's happening is each of those – let me just say it this way. WGS84 is a global reference frame. It has nothing to do with the United States by itself, so it's referenced – it's highly aligned – with thing, something called the International Terrestrial Reference Frame, if that sounds, maybe it doesn't sound familiar, but there's this global frame that the civilian communities created called ITRF. And the reason I say civilians is let's, here's the reality, GPS is a military system. It's secret, right? You get that, it's secret. There are no, bent, no brass caps out there with WGS-84 coordinates. So you can't get WGS-84, but you can get ITRF. So the Department of Defense, which I applaud them for this. For over a decade now, they've gone to a lot of effort of aligning WGS-84 with the civilian global frame. That will continue to be the case. That's never going to change. Now, 2022 datums, let's say we don't know exactly how the timing is going to work out, but at the instant it's changed from, I mean, put it this way, there will be an instant in time when all four reference frames of 2022 are exactly the same as ITRF. They'll be exactly the same at that instant in time. Now, what will happen then, though, right after that, they'll start, start drifting apart because those three frames are fixed to different tectonic plates, so they, they rotate with respect to the global frame. So it'll change. The rate of change here will be two centimeters a year horizontally, something like that, to give you an idea. So that's how, the, if that answers your questions, that's how... It'll be related. It'll be very similar. It'll be the same as WGS84 for all practical purposes when it was first created, and they'll start to drift apart. The important thing, though, is the relationship between WGS84 and uh, the 2022 datums will be very well known. So your software will handle it. And actually, that's the case right now. When you use your software, your GPS software, the very first thing it does, even if you don't think it does this, is it takes those uh, results that it gets from, say, baseline processing and converts it from WGS-84 to whatever you're working in, say, NAT-83. It always does a datum transformation, always. Now, sometimes a datum transformation is just 0, 0, 0, a, a do nothing, but not always. And this is where people get tripped up. So it's been that way for a long time where it's, it's all set up so that you can go from WGS-84 to whatever you want to use. But that should be a lot better, actually, in the future. That was a long-winded answer. I hope I hope I answered it. Okay. Sorry. Any other questions? I feel like a talk show host now, wandering around here. I was going to mention on the, the overall handout, the first uh, 11 by 17 sheet that you have, on the back of that, there's a kind of a reference handout that you could use. It's got the the coordinate definition, the, the projection parameters for all 20 zones, and then kind of a quick reference for the, the counties if, by name and see what zone it's in. And also the important part is the, the link at the bottom to uh, where to go to get those files that Michael had, had mentioned before, the DAS website. So.
Mark may be showing that. navigating to the, to the canvasgis.org. Um, this project is underneath their initiatives tab. Uh, you can see they've been on there today, even renaming it. It used to be called the low projection, low distortion oh, yeah. projection system. So now we've got the official name on there. And so if you if you click on there, um, we're going to be updating this with some of these final documents and things like that and and updating the names on here as well. Uh, well, it's actually uh, DAS that's doing the website for us. And here's the download page. So here you got the 20 zones on here. And you click on it and a little fly up comes up here. And uh, these are these are the, the downloads for the zip files and containing you know images and PDFs and shape files and project files and all that kind of stuff. That's the website. Oh any uh, any other questions or comments? Anybody? Yes sir. I'm gonna I'm gonna say a question again just so it's yeah. caught on here. What's the best resource for for um, getting access to this the KRCS information online to other users? I, 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 right now, I would say the website. I know he's I know he's planning on I think we're planning on sending some stuff around to some people, but. I was going to say we'll get this out to KSLS, the, the whole society. We'll run that through the board. Uh, we'll make sure that the Salina Seminar Series has the information available as well, uh, along with the DASC information. Looking for more? Well, I did. Yeah. Oh, have a contact person yeah. about this? Well, like Ronnie and I, the contact person on the page right now is Mark and I, so we'll work through that. Well, that's good, though. So I'm glad you asked the question. So as a follow-up, make sure the contact people on the web page are, are Mike and Mark here, right? Is that right? So yeah, yeah. you have human beings. Actually, which is always reassuring. <laughs> right, exactly. There is a manual coming out. That's right. There will be a document. As I mentioned earlier, the, the end of the project is until the the next month. So try and finish that up. Expect that after after week of the night. Yes, it, that should all be done in October. Yeah, mid October. Possibility that it could be ready by the October uh, annual meeting. That's the goal. Is that an annual meeting for? The, for uh, KSLS. Oh, okay. It'll definitely be ready by Salina. Uh, I better go. I better go back there. Uh -oh. If it's a loaded question. Currently, our state statutes uh, tell surveyors how to how to perform their surveys in the state plan coordinate system. Uh, what is our? What is, our is, that, is that true? I guess. 
what can we do uh, to get those uh, these statutes revised to, to support the new? That is a great uh, question. Coordinate system. What you said was true in most states. Uh, there's uh, statutory definitions of the state coordinate systems, which are state plane, and often uh, specifications on how to uh, determine those coordinates. And they're often very archaic. That's what Kansas says, I know Arizona says, you have to be within two miles of the second order horizontal control station in order to be able to use the horizontal coordinates for your work. Obviously, that doesn't make any sense with GPS anymore, right? So a lot of things hap are happening. The slide I had early in the presentation, that flyer that went out, really what that was about wasn't about making new state plane coordinates per se. It was about updating legislation to the new datum. I think most people know that changing legislation is very difficult, right? It's very difficult to do. It's a political process. So one thing that's happened in some states, I'll use Oregon as an example, they took their state plane coordinate system definition. They called it actually Oregon Coordinate Reference System. And they moved it into administrative rules. They moved it out of statute so it's easier to change. Because the problem right now, if Kansas is like a lot of states, they give all the projection parameters and everything in statute, right? which is not a good place for it. So hopefully, and NGS is, we're working through NSPS. What's that? Oh. Okay. I'm just blabbing away. So anyway, NGS is working with NSPS and American Association for Geodetic Surveying to help contact all the states to help them update statutes for 2022. Because it's the reality is it's there's no point updating it for NAT83 now because it's so difficult to change legislation anyway. I'm gonna help them make it more generic instead of saying it's exactly reference to uh, NAT Ref 2022. It's reference to the National Spatial Reference System or its, or its successor, so it's generic. So you can keep your statute. Your statute just automatically stays up to date instead of having to go in and tweak it. And then move the stuff that is specific, something like administrative rules where it's easier to update. So that, that's a good question. I think every state, pretty much every state's in the situation you're in right now where in statute, if someone actually followed the statute, they'd have a hard time using state plane coordinates in their state anyway, at least by statute, right? With all the requirements for using horizontal control and the distance you can be from it. That's a good question. Yes, sir. Right. I can't go over there, I guess. Oh, the state licensing board will be looking at this? Oh, that would, okay. And so they're, they're involved in influencing what's in statute then as well. They're more they're on the administrative side, though, I guess. Okay. That would be good if they look at this. Okay. Any any other questions or comments, folks? Folks talked about how we're going to be putting the systems into the data collectors, how how they'll use the system. Free to, to join if you would like, but with that, I close it up here and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yeah.